This is Mike Johnson with the download edition of World Business Report for Wednesday, February the 4th. A corruption scandal faces, uh, forces a boardroom clear-out at Brazil's biggest energy company, Petrobras. Some people say that corruption would account to basically $3 billion. Some people say it could go up to $34 billion. So it's a big discrepancy. We'll hear how much damage the scandal is doing to Brazil's international reputation. Also in this edition, pay your fair share of taxes. The Archbishop of Canterbury takes the moral high ground with business. With wealth comes power. Don't misuse the power you've got through wealth. How homeopathy became big business in India. And as the US singer Taylor Swift tries to trademark her lyrics, is it an offence against free speech or a smart move by a shrewd businesswoman? She's trying to take essentially common idioms that people use and then own them, privatise them, and then make sure that only she can profit off of them. That's all coming up over the next half an hour or so. Well, it's one of the biggest companies, not just in Brazil, but Latin America too. Somos brasileiros e vamos mais Vamos mostrar como é que se faz Gente que sonha e realiza Somos Petrobras For many Brazilians, Petrobras is the business face of their country. This company ad from 2012 goes as far as to feature people saying, I am Brazil, I am Petrobras. But even by Brazilian standards, a corruption scandal now embroiling the country's biggest energy company is an eye-popping one. Allegations of price-fixing and bribes paid to politicians have shaken the government of President Dilma Rousseff, who chaired the Petrobras board for seven years until 2010. Prosecutors have uncovered around $800 million in bribes and other illegal funds. More than 200 other businesses are also being investigated. The chief executive of Petrobras, Maria das Graça Forza, has now resigned in the wake of the scandal, along with five other executives. The BBC, the BBC South American business correspondent, Daniel Gallas, has been following the story and he gave me more background. Everything that's happening with Petrobras now was uncovered by something called Operation Car Wash by the Brazilian authorities. Basically, among the many scandals that people found out was that Petrobras contracts, each contract or investment done by Petrobras over the past few years, and that goes over a decade. Well, many of these contracts, 3% of them, uh, were go- the money was going into political parties. So it was just a basic question of politicians getting money from a state-owned company. As simple as that. Uh, actually, Graça Foster was someone who was expected to sort of take charge and work out with the government and with the authorities and get some sort of leadership back into the company. But she hasn't been able to do that. The corruption scandal is just getting worse and worse. Last week, there was a meeting in the board of directors and they were going to come up with a number, sort of a corruption magic number, and saying this is how much Petrobras lost due to corruption. And there was infighting between people in the meeting room and some people say that corruption would account to basically $3 billion. Some people say it could go up to $34 billion. So it's a big discrepancy there. And for people listening who may not know much about Petrobras, it's a massive company and a big, big part of Brazilian business and society, isn't it? Petrobras is a very important company for um, Brazil, for Brazilians. Uh, a while back, there was a massive wave of privatizations, and Petrobras was the, one of the very few companies that was spared because it was just seen as a big, you know, national symbol. And it's also been at the forefront of uh, deep oil drilling since the 1970s. And that's sort of seen as a new frontier. I mean, if traditional oil wells dry up, you're going to have to look for oil somewhere else. So like Shell is trying to do it up in the Arctic, but it needs environmental licenses to do that. Petrobras is very good uh, with deep sea oil drilling. And since 2006, Petrobras uncovered massive new oil wells and rigs and, uh, under the seabed. And it's become a very, very valuable company since then. So for this all to happen with Petrobras now is a bit of a shock because a while back, Petrobras was doing really well. And people were seeing this is a company that Brazilians can be really, really proud of. Now it's just a synonym for, for, for corruption. And corruption has been a big issue, has it, in Brazil? Because people have been talking up the Brazilian economy for years, haven't they? Uh, Is corruption one of the things that's been holding it back, do you think? Brazilians don't trust the institutions because of corruption. I think that's the bottom line. And that's what's happening with Petrobras again. Again, you see a company where people are starting to feel proud of uh, but then all these corruption scandals, they hit back again. I think in the case of Petrobras, it's even larger than that because 
it, it, we're talking about very big numbers. I mean, $34 billion corruption magic number is the real number. That's about the size of a business like Uber. Uh, it, it's, it's really just a whole business lost to In corruption. Itself. So there is a sense that a lot of money is being wasted through corruption and also a, a lot of confidence in government and governance is, is being lost. OK, so now the chief executive and five other executives have been edged out by, by the government, we, we assume they've been kicked out. How far does that go, do you think, to getting on top of this affair now? Or does it simply raise more questions than it answers? It, it's all coming down to who's replacing the new board of directors because with Grasa Forces and, and, and the people who were there now, there was just simply this idea that they weren't going to take care of corruption. They weren't going to make Petrobras profitable again. They weren't going to make Petrobras be seen as a very trustworthy company in the market. But the question is, who do you bring in to do that? And the government doesn't have many options for that right now because Operation Car Wash, which is this operation that sort of uh, uncovered all these corruption scandals, they also uncovered corruption scandals in many other big businesses in Brazil. So there aren't many people who could do the job right now. That was the BBC South American business correspondent, Daniel Gallas. You're listening to World Business Report from the BBC World Service. Still to come, the business of homeopathy in India. Many of the patients here are having cancers and uh, kidney diseases. It has been cured. It works. It works like a magic, but it, it takes some time. That's later. First, though, let's get the very latest from the financial markets. Kathleen Brooks, research director at Forex.com, is with me in the studio. Kathleen, talks continue between the new Greek government and its lenders. Athens has been trying to raise some more money on the bond markets today. What happened? Well, it didn't have a very successful time. It raised over $600 million, but um, at just one year debt, demand was very, very weak. So it was the lowest level since 2006. And if you think back in 2006, there wasn't even this debt crisis going on. So uh, it just goes to show that, you know, since Greece has been back in the bond markets over the last year, things have gone bad for worse. Since bad to worse, really, since the election. So one year debt ago. means it's it's people um, lending Greece money over a shorter period of time, and and, and that's viewed as less less risky, is it? Or um, how, how does that work? Usually, it is viewed as less risky, but I think in mm. this environment, the fact that demand was so low uh, was because it's even more risky. Because we've got a new government in Greece; they're quite radical. They're trying to change things with their uh, with their de- with their bailout terms with the Euro- European authorities, and. I think I think there's a real risk of default, and I think that's why investors have kept away from this debt auction. OK, let's see how that goes over the next few days, especially those talks. News uh, from the Chinese Central Bank today that investors were keeping an eye on. What happened? Absolutely. Well, they, they, they loosened monetary policy. So they cut a, a, rate, that, a rate that banks need to hold uh, reserves, basically, which essentially it's a bit like an interest rate cut um, by 0.5%. So bring it down to 19.5% of the reserve required ratio. And that's basically to try and boost lending because its growth has been very, very weak. China has been a massive underperformer. The UK is in a much stronger position at the moment than China is, just to put it into some perspective. OK, so that's the Chinese central bank trying to encourage banks not to park money with it, but to, to go out there into the real economy and lend it to households and businesses. Exactly. Lend it to, lend it to, the, to the public and try and boost growth that way because it's not been doing particularly well. The Chinese renminbi is also quite strong because it's pegged to the dollar and that's hurting its exports. OK, and we had some uh, results from General Motors, obviously the American car company. Uh, what do we hear today on that? That was I mean, really good results from them. Pre-tax profits were up nearly 30% uh, compared to uh, the end of 2013. Um, there was a dividend increase and then what was really good for the workers, I suppose, each uh, worker is going to get a $9,000 bonus. So Very they nice. really are sharing but it it's, it's been battling with all these recalls, hasn't it, over the last... Uh, uh, well, a few years now. It has, but what's been been much better for it, actually, has been the drop in the oil price because that's really boosted sales of pickup trucks and SUVs and that's where GM makes a lot of its money from. So when the oil price was very high, demand for those type of vehicles fell off a cliff and now it's coming back. All right, Kathleen, thanks very much indeed Thank for you. coming in. That was Kathleen Brooks at Forex.com. Well, the main share index here in London was uh, at 6,860. The Dow in New York uh, at the moment, that's up a third of a percent at 17,726. On the currency markets, the dollar, uh, sorry, the euro is at one dollar fourteen point one US cents. Pay your fair share of tax. That is pretty much the message to business from the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's told the BBC that high levels of inequality need to be tackled and that although it's wrong to be anti-business, wealth requires responsibility. The BBC's business editor, Kamal Ahmed, asked Archbishop Justin Welby if inequality was ingrained in society. It's a very good question. Certainly the figures seem to 
indicate that differentials between pay at the top and average pay have widened hugely in the last 35 to 40 years. And certainly there was a very interesting collection of essays last summer by, uh, in which Larry Summers contributed, which suggested that the next 40 years will see growing inequality and, and centred on that. At Davos, uh, it was the big topic of discussion. So clearly people do feel that inequality is becoming systemic. But there is also clearly concern about that. And what should we do about that? Uh, we being a mixture of business, government, again, setting the culture, the way the tax system works, making sure people pay their fair taxes where the money has been earned. That's a very ancient principle. goes back hundreds of years. There are all sorts of particular areas that address it. It is quite interesting that at Davos, with all the you know, the sort of richest people in the world, the most powerful people in the world, this was the major issue that people discussed, and they discussed it at a global level. That by itself is already an encouraging sign. The Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, at the World Economic Forum, said that, for example, technology companies had to take on more responsibility over where they paid their taxes. Do you agree with that? Yes. I mean, Mark Carney is one of the experts on this. I'd be a bit of an idiot to disagree with him. Um, it, there's always been the principle that you pay tax where you earn the money. And if you earn the money in a particular country, the revenue service of that country needs to get a fair share of what you've earned. One of the problems we've got, of course, is we've got this unbelievably complex tax system internationally and uh, in each country, in most countries, not in all, but in most. Someone said the other day that the tax system was of biblical proportions. Well, the Bible's only a thousand pages. How many tax systems are only a thousand pages? There are several hundred times that. There needs to be simplification in tax uh, so that people are responsible in the right place. I mean, it goes back, there are very basic principles that, that uh, as a Christian, that we, we see that Jesus Christ spoke of about uh, the importance of people paying what's due. The Bible speaks of it endlessly. You give what you are due to give. The Bible talks about paying your tax properly, actually. Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, says, pay the taxes you owe. So it's not a new question. So it's a moral issue? Well, of course it is. Yes, because tax is part of solidarity. Tax is saying, I belong to this place. I benefit from the fact that we have police and a health service and that we have welfare system and that we have external security. The tax is saying, I belong to that, and therefore I contribute to it. Some business leaders uh, complain that there is an anti-business sentiment, that wealth creation is not um, supported and lauded as a good thing in a market economy. Uh, what do you say to people who, business leaders, who say there's an anti-business sentiment among politicians, in the government, maybe in the archbishop, church. in the <laughs> church themselves? <laughs> what do you say to business leaders who, who, who complain that, that no one appreciates what they do? They take risks, they create wealth, they create jobs. Well, you've already heard me say that I'm strongly in favour of creativity of wealth and jobs and and, and risk-taking and, and all that goes with that. I, I always have a slightly wry smile when they say that to me because um, at the other side, within the church, we're accused of being too business-minded at the moment. So, you know, it probably indicates we're somewhere in the right place. But it, business is important. We need to affirm the significance of those who generate and create wealth. But we also need to be realistic about the fact, and again, this goes back hundreds of years, Adam Smith again talked about it, that with wealth comes power, and with power comes a temptation to misuse power. We have to, there's a reality of the human condition of what Christians call sin, what the Bible calls sin, which says don't misuse the power you've got through wealth. Do you fear that some are? That, when haven't they? In history. And you find this in the book of Isaiah, you know, 800 years before Christ. Uh, there's always elements where that happens, because people are people. But that doesn't mean you, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say business is bad. You say that we need solidarity and there needs to be a regulatory framework that doesn't allow the abusive part, but that gives freedom for creativity. The thoughts of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, speaking to the BBC's Kamal Ahmed. 
Now, if you thought homeopathy was a bit niche and fringy, well, not in India it isn't. More than 100 million people now use homeopathic medicines in the world's largest democracy. As a business, it's growing by more than 30% a year. That perhaps explains why the Indian government ministry, which deals with alternative medicines, has asked for a six-fold increase in its budget. As Rahul Tandon reports from Calcutta, homeopathy has fast become an important part of India's growing medical industry. Dr. Prashant Banerjee treats only critical cases like cancer. It's early in the morning here in Calcutta, but there's already a long queue outside the brown gates in front of me. I'm stood outside Calcutta's most famous homeopathic clinic. It's run by the Banerjee family. Let's go and talk to some of the patients who've been queuing for hours already. Most people who come here are unwell. So please be... People come here, they stand in the queue for two, three, four hours like that. The reason is that they have been getting results. It is cheaper also for the common people. My wife has a cyst. It will definitely work because I know uh, many of the patients here are having cancers and uh, kidney diseases. It has been cured. It works. It works like a magic, but it, it takes some time. The doors to the clinic have opened and I'm now sat in the waiting room. But what is homeopathy? Well, it was developed in Germany in the late 1700s and it's based on the concept that like cures like. Basically, that means that a substance taken in small amounts will cure the same symptoms it causes if it was taken in large amounts. Good evening, City Clinic. Dr. Shurmisha Bandhubadha. Hi, ENT specialist. Yeah, yeah. I've walked a little bit further down the road and come to Dr. Shemista Bandapadia's clinic. This is not a homeopathic one. It's not as busy as the one I was at earlier. Dr. Bandapadia is a fierce critic of homeopathy. She believes that in spite of its growing popularity here in India, many patients are being duped. Lots of patients are being referred by homeopathy doctors in their advanced stages of cancer. In initial stage, they used to say that they can cure cancer. And uh, when the patient used to come to the hospitals, they're already in stage 3, stage 4 stage. In most of the cancer, the stage 3, stage 4 stages are uncurable. In spite of those concerns, homeopathy is getting more and more popular across India. It's a multi-million pound industry that's growing at more than 30% every year. I've come to have a cup of chai or tea with Sandeep Roy, one of India's leading columnists. All these things coexist, so the same person might be treating himself with both homeopathic medicines and allopathic medicines and see no disconnect in the fact that he's crossing so many streams of, of medicine that are often butting heads with each other. He takes them sort of equally seriously, which probably makes sense in a country where Hindus have so many gods and you worship all of them and don't give anyone particular precedence. I mean, in the world also, I think more than the second or third. But the main reason why homeopathy is so popular here is because people believe that it works. I've come to the house of Tapas Raha. He sat on the sofa having a conversation with his wife. Three years ago, he was told that he had just a few weeks to live after he was diagnosed with brain cancer he turned to homeopathic doctors, and he's still alive today. Till now, I'm surviving under homeopathy. Main thing is, I can see myself that the improvement, which I was totally hospitalized for over 38 months, and then under homeopathy, slowly reduced my tumor. And do you think that your case is helping change some people's reservations about homeopathy? I do not uh, care, actually, what they can say, but I'm much better, much, much better. Back at the Banerjee's homeopathic clinic, there are still long queues. We could see more scenes like this across India soon because the Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, is a big fan of this type of medicine. Dr Pradeep Banerjee is the latest member of the family to become a homeopath. See, homeopathy is the medicine of the future. It is easy to give and administer and... The cost versus the conventional allopathic medicine is almost like nil. So homeopathy will actually be able to help a much larger population with a much less amount of economic damage to the country. That being so, we really applaud Mr. Modi's uh, endeavor to actually create a 
ministry for this system of medicine. The names of critical patients and those of you coming from far. Every day more than 1,200 patients come to this clinic. Some may question the effectiveness of homeopathy, but here in the world's largest democracy, it is an important part of this country's medical infrastructure. Rahul Tandon reporting from Calcutta. Now, an attempt by the American singer Taylor Swift to trademark lyrics from her latest album is striking a discordant note in some quarters. She wants to stop phrases including this sick beat and we never go out of style from being used on products like T-shirts and stickers. And you might want to turn the volume down a little bit at this point because it's a move which has angered another American singer. I think you get the point. Ben Norton is, in fact, is uh, so cross about what Taylor Swift is trying to do. He's recording this not terribly lyrically challenging song called This Sick Beat. He told me why. If you make a painting, you know, of a landmark or if you write a song, I understand completely why those are your intellectual property. Those those are creative acts. Taylor Swift, however, and others, you know, McDonald's and Nike that are trademarking these common three word phrases that people use in their everyday lives. Those aren't creative acts. This sick beat was not a phrase that, that Taylor Swift created. It's not like, you know, Microsoft or these, these proper nouns that people made. She's trying to take essentially common idioms that people use and then own them, privatize them from what is technically the linguistic cultural commons, and then make sure that only she can profit off of them. Only she can put them on, you know, merchandise and use them in songs and lyrics and things like that. And I think that we should be very, very careful about the ability of people to do these kinds of things. People say that anyone can take a trademark out on anything they invent, but it takes a lot of legal and economic resources. So what we're really saying is that people who are wealthy can take common idioms that we speak and then own them and then make money off of them. And I think with my song, I was trying to make sure that the people think more critically about this issue because trademarks are not just black or white. And there are subtleties that we should take into consideration. I'm not necessarily saying that we should throw out the whole idea of intellectual property in general, but I'm saying we should just think about it a little more carefully. But it is just about merchandise, isn't it? She's not saying, look, people can't use these words ever again. They can't say them or indeed, as far as I understand it, she's not saying people can't put out songs like you've put out this song using those three words, this sick beat. She's not saying you can't do that. She's simply saying you can't make money by trying to flog a T-shirt with it on. Well, that's part of it. I mean, clearly the, the most important reason she's trademarking it is for merchandising. And you can look at when she applied for the trademarks. Uh, if you go to trademarks.justia.com, there's a list of, you know, paper products, musical instruments. But part of this is it's not just physical merchandise. Part of it is also sheet music and digital downloadable content and things like that. It says, for instance, the sick beat cannot be used in public appearances, non-downloadable content and non-downloadable multimedia, et cetera, et cetera. So this does extend beyond, you know, keychains and T-shirts. The American singer Ben Norton. Well, Jenny Affia specialises in protecting the reputations of celebrities at the London law firm Shillings. What was her reaction to what Taylor Swift was trying to do? I think she's got a, a decent chance. These phrases are distinctive in that they're a well-known part of her songs and her album. I don't think they've been trademarked previously and they're capable of being represented in graphic form. So she does stand a good chance of successfully having them trademarked. And are there precedents for, well, effectively trademarking words, which is what she's trying to do? Yes, definitely. Brands have done it successfully for years. So various memorable advertising slogans have been trademarked. Comedy catchphrases have been trademarked. Even things like colours, slightly more complicatedly, smells the shape of a product. There's a huge range of protection given to commercial products. And what Taylor Swift is trying to do is to say that her her song lyrics, distinctive parts of them, are part of her commercial brand. Yeah, because they, I guess, eventually, she's hoping, become so closely associated with her in the same way that catchphrases, slogans that brands use become associated with them, the companies behind them would argue. Exactly, and that makes sense with the... We all know the troubles that the music industry has faced over the years and how income doesn't derive from selling 
singles anymore necessarily, but it's the it's the products around around the artists. Right, and she's going to need to be able to prove exactly what I've just said, that these phrases, although I guess a phrase like we never go out of style, it's not exactly a phrase probably that has never been used before in humankind, but, but she's going to have to be able to prove that these phrases are very closely identified with her as an artist. That's part of it. It's, she will have to prove that they're distinctive, that they're not associated with any other artist or brand. But then it's really important to note she's not saying that nobody can use those common words. What she's saying is they can't be used in connection with any other commercial product. Like a T-shirt, for example? Precisely. OK, so what she's really trying to do here is keep a hold on her merchandising royalties, possible subsequent merchandising royalties, right? Anyone is free to scream out the words at the top of their lungs if they want to. It's about making a profit from somebody else's brand. Someone um, put it to me recently that an artist's song is just like their business card nowadays and where where the income comes from are all the associated products around it, which you can make a judgment call on or not, but it is just the the state of the industry. Sign of the times. That was the London-based privacy lawyer Jenny Affia. Just time for our main business headline. Six senior executives at the Brazilian energy company Petrobras, including the chief executive, have resigned following a corruption scandal. And that's all from me, Mike Johnson, and this World Business Report. And that's all for this download, World Business Report.